let's just start from the beginning. If you can just give us a brief outline, just a couple of minutes, uh, on the position you outline in what we owe the future. What is the, what is the book about? What's the message you want to convey? Uh, sure. So the core argument in the book is just the future people count, morally speaking. Could be a lot of them, so they count for a lot. And we can make their lives go better or worse. And we actually can impact um, not just the present generation, but many generations to come. Um, how can we do that latter thing? Uh, well, we can either prevent risks of global catastrophe, um, such as from uh, pandemics, particularly worried by man-made pandemics, um, uh, or from uh, certain disasters related to AI, also from uh, war, I talk as well about nuclear war and extreme climate change a little bit too. Um, or we can make the future go better even in worlds where um, civilization continues a long time into the future. Uh, where I focus in particular on ensuring that uh, we develop AI in the right way and ensure that uh, AI is aligned with um, positive values. Um, and secondly, that we um, try and promote better moral values so that the future isn't governed by you know, perhaps uh, dictators um, who are more just after their own interests rather than their um, overall good, or that we just, or to avoid the situation where um, uh, we end up with just very bad moral values, like you can imagine the values that govern the Roman Empire continuing kind of indefinitely into the future would be a very bad outcome again. This whole package of um, views uh, I call long term the idea that we should be doing much more than we currently are to um, in, you know, protect uh, the interests of future generations. So I think one of the striking things about the book is just how far you draw the lines up, and just how far ahead into the future yeah. you think. I mean, it's a very big idea in that sense. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very beautifully illustrated example in the beginning, which is, I think, more powerful when you actually read the book. Just give us a sense of like how far ahead you... For sure. So, um, yeah, when politicians talk about long-term thinking, they're meaning like four years. Um, sometimes you get thinking over the course of decades. Um, then, you know, within climate science and uh, storage of nuclear waste, sometimes you can get thinking over centuries. But really, I think future people matter, no matter when they are located in time. So, you know, I give the story, you're hiking, um, and you drop a glass bottle, and you think, should I clean up after myself? And you think, well, maybe I should, because someone might walk in the trail and cut themselves. And does it matter, morally speaking, when that person would cut themselves, whether it's tomorrow, or in a week's time, or in a year, or a century? And I think the answer is no. Harm is harm whenever it occurs. But if so, then, wow, actually, maybe some of our actions today could be having extremely long-term impacts, because there's no reason, really, why uh, civilization might not last for a very long time indeed. So Homo sapiens evolved you know, a thousand years ago. Typical mammal species last about a million years. The Earth will be remain habitable for hundreds of millions of years. And if there's some sort of existential catastrophe, something that you know completely ends human life or leads to some stable but very bad state, like a stable dictatorian, uh, stable dictator, global dictatorship. Well, that's an effect that really could last for that entire um, entire future. And kind of given those stakes, you just start to kind of boggle at um, the responsibility that we have. So you told me just before this, Will, uh, that the Korean translation of effective <laughs> altruism is actually cold-hearted altruism. <laughs> I, <that> wonderful. <laughs> I did not get a say in that translation. They told me it was going to be objective altruism. But, uh, they were being a little cold-hearted, perhaps. <laughs> it sold a lot of copies as a result. So I think that the so effective altruism, um, you know, the uh, and you know the ideas of this very sort of calculated, rational approach, I guess, to, mm -hmm. to giving and philanthropy of earning to give and concepts like that, and then long-termism, the the idea that to do the most good, we must consider the lives not just of people here today, but also of people who will live in the future. Mm. Really interested to hear your, your, you talk a little bit about how these concepts, the sort of mental steps from one concept to the other, mm. and maybe, I guess, from my perspective, it's sort of from the outside, it looks like one evolved from the other, but yeah. maybe that's not the case. So just to hear maybe how your thinking here has evolved. Uh, yeah, so I can certainly talk about my own thinking, which um, 
you can really map like this expanding kind of moral circle. So as a teenager growing up in Glasgow and Scotland, um, you know, I had this intense motivation uh, to want to do good. Um, and so I started volunteering in my local community. I was helping to run a scout troop for children with disabilities. Um, I started working at an old folks home, looking after the elderly. Um, so that's kind of natural impulse, uh, so very much given in my own community. Uh, but then I started learning about um, uh, global ill health and global poverty. Um, I remember just very clearly uh, reading in a book that um, 46 million people at the time had died of HIV AIDS. And it was just, I immediately just thought, that's fucked up. Just, that's absolutely fucked up, and we are not doing anything about this. Why are we not talking about this all the time? And um, I confess, I was not then immediately taking action on global health and development. Instead, I had a, a period of several years of just feeling guilty and not really doing very much while well, partying. It was mainly what I was doing it was, uh, while I was an undergrad. But over time, those ideas just kept weighing on me. Once I started my master's degree, with this kind of life plan of becoming a very much an ivory tower philosopher, working on these like beautiful logic puzzles that would have no benefit for anyone. I just thought, like, this is not living my life in accordance with my values. And so I started working quite heavily on um, global health and development work, set up Giving What We Can, which encourages people to give at least 10% of their income. Um, and that was, you know, extending the moral circle from, you know, my local community in Glasgow to everyone in the world, because I was really convinced it makes no difference if, if someone is suffering, whether they're in, um, uh, you know, Kenya or Glasgow, it doesn't, shouldn't make a difference. But then over time, um, you know, I was exposed to these arguments that we should be just as concerned by future generations as we are for the present generation. <clears throat> then secondly, the fact that, wow, there are just so many future people to come. So there are about 100 billion people who have lived and died so far, about 8 billion people alive today, but yet, you know, trillions of people um, yet to come. And, uh, you know, that, so future people outnumber this like a thousand to one. And therefore, if we can, positively impact how their lives goes, is there are things happening now that um, could lead to you know, a dystopian future, no future at all. We should be really working to prevent that. And that argument was hard, like initially it left me kind of cold. Um, it took me many years to come around to those ideas. But this does represent like, an evolution of my thought to have that fully expanded circle where we're taking the interests of all people around the world and future generations at the same time into account. There's a, a, a really beautiful chapter in the book that talks about what you call value changes mm. in society. And you exemplify, exemplify that by looking at the abolition of slavery. Yeah. And you talk about Benjamin Lay, who was a Quaker activist, played a, a key role in the abolition movement. And the argument, if I understand it correctly, is that the abolition of slavery happened not necessarily because of financial incentives, but rather sort of a shift in the moral values of society yeah. and the sort of act of making that shift happen was really the, the sort of key good or the, the key change that happened there. So I guess with, with that in mind and looking at the world today, really curious to hear your thing and of course adopting sort of a long term, long term yeah. position on it and I guess speaking from our sort of western and very privileged perspective on this. What would you say is the most important values change for us to promote in society today so to yield yeah. the most good for, yeah. for the future? Okay, it's a great question. And yeah, the reason I went into values changes so much is because when we're thinking about having very long-term impact, you need to think about things that changes you can make that wouldn't really happen otherwise. Um, so maybe you make some great invention, but some other colleague of yours would have made it five years later. That's not a very long-term impact. But I think for moral values that we hold, actually those can be very long-term impacts. And I think abolition of slavery was one that, if it hadn't been for particular campaigns, it might have been decades, even centuries later, that um, slavery was abolished. Uh, now in the world today, um, I think that uh, many of the most important um, changes are relate to this idea of an expanding circle. And the kind of underlying thing is a willingness to use kind of reason to guide our empathy. Where when I look at like who are the groups that are currently, um, whose interests are currently most systematically being neglected, uh, it's ones that are kind of out of sight and out of mind. 
So animals are effectively farms. You know, we're closing in on 100 billion animals slaughtered every year, and the vast majority of them are just literally being tortured through the course of their life. People in poor countries, again, they don't make the news. Like 5,000 children died today. Um, that's like a jumbo jet, like crashing into a mountain. Like that does not get reported on. Again, they're out of sight, out of sight, and out of mind. Treatment of prisoners, um, I think it's particularly bad in the US, which I know well, but it's just mil literally millions of people being um, jailed, you know, parents taken away from their children on the basis of like nonviolent drug offenses. Um, these are things that if, uh, that I think, if society keeps progressing morally, um, we will look back on as just catastrophes, as just abominations. And so, the thing that I would like us to push on most is starting to take seriously this idea that um, all people, even all sentient beings, are um, morally equal, morally deserving. Um, uh, because I don't think it's inevitable that that progression happens. So, um, I'd just like to touch on some of the criticism the book has received as well. And I think most of it, from what I can read, seems to boil down to something you actually spent quite a lot of time on yeah. the book in the chapter on population population yeah. ethics. Yeah. Where, where sort of to be fair, you, you do preface that quite clearly by saying, you know, this, this lead to, might lead to unintuitive yeah. and unappealing yeah. uh, implications. Yeah. Um, but but I guess the question there is like where do you draw the line between theory and practice in mm -hmm. the ideas that you put forward in the book? Some of the ideas here if taken at face value. Yeah would have pretty severe practical implications and practically you know could be used to justify a lot of suffering today for mm -hmm. more happiness in the future. Yeah. So so would just love to hear your comment on that in general and how you think of sort of that balance between the idea and the practical implications of the idea. Yeah, sure. I mean I do think there's just a strong general case for like moderation and non-extremism. Um, especially when you're taking kind of philosophical yeah, philosophical ideas that uh, you know feel good in the armchair and then like applying them. Um, you know, there are just important lessons from history, like uh, the idea of workers' rights and socialism, communism, I think are like great ideas, especially in the armchair, and then like enormously abused over the course of the 20th century, like, um, you know, close to 100 million people died in the USSR and um, China as a result of abuse of these ideas in light of some like philosophical aim. And so I think the right way of, um, you know, philosophical arguments um, being, because but then on the other hand, some ideas that seem radical, like abolition of slavery, or, like, um, or the idea of human rights, like actually are very important. And so the correct mechanism is that um, you have thinkers, and they advocate, and they make arguments, and uh, we kind of like tentatively like start incorporating them into our worldview, um, rather than suddenly abandoning everything in terms of this like one ideal. And so yeah, in the book I talk about long-termism as a supplement to common sense rather than a replacement for it. So there's all you know, there's all sorts of kind of common sense moral reasoning about integrity, respecting moral rules, you know, don't lie, just live a stylistically good life, um, uh, care for the poor, and so on. But then, hey, actually, there's some things we could do, like um, start caring about future generations much more. Or in the case of population ethics, seeing you know the non-existence of future generations as a result of an existential catastrophe as a sort of moral loss. Um, these are things that we can incorporate into our ethical thinking without having to like abandon everything that we've already learned, probably speaking. Uh, some of the some of you were writing around the book and some of the blog posts yeah. you did, I think, before the book was published, you, you make a distinction between, I guess, normal or just long-termism yeah. long yeah. and the idea of strong long-termism, with the sort of key differentiator there being whether whether influencing the long-term future is a moral priority in yeah. our time or whether it's the moral priority in our time. Yeah. So I'm curious to hear you as a person, you know, the book is out there, you, you spent last year talking to people about this. Where are you on that scale? Uh, sure, so one caveat I want to make, I kind of slightly regret the term strong long termism now because people, you know, my co-author, uh, Hilary Gray, she's actually visiting Stockholm University, but she has a large family and couldn't make it today. Um, you know, we spent weeks defining the term, like this is what philosophers do. Um, and is extremely misunderstood. So uh, people think strong, strong long term. It's like what a waste of time. Um, so people think strong long termism means you know we should dedicate ninety nine percent of the world's resources yeah. to benefiting the future. Kind of okay, exactly. And that's not it. Definition of the term is strong long termism is that 
the most important fact, uh, factor in the most important decisions today are how those decisions impact the long-term future. So think of an analogy of someone saying, risk of nuclear war is the key moral issue of our time, or climate change is the key moral issue of our time. Strong long-termism is saying uh, issues that impact uh, the long-term future, not just the present, are the key issue of our time. Um, and once I've done all of that folk clearing, then uh, yeah, I'm like, um, uh, ultimately I do uh, endorse strong long-termism of that form. Um, I'm not like super confident in it, like I'm not 100%. Um, in a preface to the paperback of the book, I suggest like, I also don't think it makes much difference now. So there's this question of like, okay, how much of the world's resources should we spend on future generations versus non-future? Um, I don't know what the correct answer is there, but currently it's kind of close to zero percent, and it could be higher than that. And so, in a pe uh, yeah, preface to the paperback, um, I suggest kind of a goal of society is aiming for like one percent of the GDP of rich countries to be focused on issues that distinctively impact future generations, such as the mitigation of existential risks. And then that would put that kind of level pegging with things like global health and development, climate change, and so on. And then, if we achieve that, which I don't think we will in my lifetime, but you know, fingers crossed, then maybe we can reassess and think like how much progress. Maybe there's just nothing more to do that would be terrific. Um, we can you know reassess on uh, whether a society as a whole should go even further. So, one of the final chapters of the book, you discuss whether to have an optimistic or a pessimistic outlook on the future. Mm. I, I found it really interesting, but at the end, I, I, I at least did not pick up sort of a conclusive answer from, from yourself. Yeah. So, so I'd like to ask you, uh, and again, given the time since the book was published, and you know, during this time I imagine you have your arguments and your positions sort of challenged mm. and critiqued by every, from every conceivable angle, um, are you an optimist or a pessimist when it comes to humanity's long-term future? Uh, yeah, so two sentences of optimism and pessimism. There's one sense in which I'm strongly an optimist, which is the kind of action-relevant sense. And that's the question of, like, can we make things better? <laughs> so no matter how bad you think the world is, if you can make it better, then uh, you, should be optimistic. you should be optimistic in the sense of thinking, yeah, we can do this. Um, that's the key thing I want to promote. But then ultimately, I'm a, I'm a kind of optimist or a tentative optimist about humanity's long-term future, too. So I'm an optimist in the sense that I think it's better than nothing. Um, <laughs> and that's quite a low bar, you know? Um, uh, I'm not an optimist in the sense, you know, there's some people who think, um, look, if we avoid any sort of catastrophe, major catastrophe, then, you know, 50-50 at least, or more likely than not, civilization will just figure out what the best thing is, what the right kind of, what the best society looks like, and just implement that. Um, I'm not an optimist in that sense. I think it's kind of very contingent whether we produce um, the, you know, a really, really good society or whether we produce a dystopian society where almost everyone is disenfranchised and power is in the hands of a very small number of beings. Um, or if it's something in between where we build a society that people think is great and flourishing but is actually like the Roman Empire and they just you know, never realize that slavery is impermissible or that, you know, torturing foreigners for fun is impermissible or something. Um, I think there's a whole range of possibilities. And so, um, uh, yeah, I think I expect the future to be um, good in a sense, better than nothing, but also very strong risk that we fall far short of the sort of great future that is, is open to us. So utopia or dystopia, what, what, what is kind of more likely? So I think utopia is much more likely than, at least there's, Dystopia in the sense of like, um, we, you know, we still like, there's huge amounts of unnecessary suffering and um, I think that is like very plausible. But then it's what you could call kind of anti-utopia or something, which is the worst possible future. And there I really think there is an asymmetry. So if you tell me in the future we produced a society that was um, close to the best thing that we could have produced, um, then I can tell you a story about why, which is like, you know, lots of people want to make the world better, they want to progress morally, perhaps we really got our act together and that was the dominant force. If you say, oh, the future's actually it's like the worst thing we could have done, <laughs> like actively the worst possible future, everyone suffers as much as possible, it's much harder to tell a story where that happens because evil tends to happen at least as a side effect of other actions, um, rather than um, because people actively want to do bad things. 
profits because they want to you know, have power for themselves or benefit themselves and don't care about suffering. Um, and that, I think, biases how we should think about the future in a positive direction. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. We still will have some time, so I'm going to open up for questions, and I'm going to go to you first. You're going to have to shout. Okay, so <coughs> thank you, uh, first of all. So given the track record uh, so far of the human species, what do you think is the like moral argument for including us in long-termism? Uh, if you take also the suffering of other species uh, into consideration and nature. So, mm -hmm. uh, that's my first question. And related to that, how do you think the current system of democracy and capitalism is compatible uh, with long termism? And what kind of changes or structures do we need to set up? Uh, okay. To yeah, great. So I've got this um, yeah, chapter in the book on the value of the future. And I talk a lot about the value of now and the value of the past, and in particular, humanity's impact on animals, where um, in particular, I think the existence of um, factory farming, um, you know, quite plausibly just, there's all of, you know, all of the like positive experiences of humanity, which I think over the last couple of hundred of years have like, you know, increased a lot. People have much higher well-being lives, um, have, uh, a much less disease and suffering um, than they had in the past. So all this kind of human progress, but then we have all of this moral regress, and like anti-progress with respect to the harms we're inflicting on non-human animals. And I don't know how it balances out actually when we look, um, say, at the last kind of hundred years. And that's a big dark thought. Um, I do think things are different into the future. Like I don't expect on you know, almost all progressions of the future. I don't expect factory farming to kind of continue indefinitely for the reason that, again, people don't actively want animals to suffer. It's that they just don't care. And some people actively want animals not to suffer. And as technology advances, um, in particular with respect to animals, once we get um, cultivated meat, so um, meat that is just as good and cheaper um, and healthier, but doesn't involve the suffering, uh, I would expect that to kind of go away. Um, factory, the, you know, these worse excesses of factory farming to go away like pretty uh, quickly. So I agree, it's like a very tricky issue, um, but that's my kind of overall take. And then with respect to democracy and capitalism, um, I mean, democracy in particular is one of these kind of moral values that I worry of. That is very contingent. So I really worry. Suppose there was some great catastrophe, a nuclear war. Um, and it really put kind of civilization back, uh, you know, mid-centuries or thousands of years. Would we get a society with the current levels of technological development where democracy was as widespread as it is today? I don't know, maybe I'm like optimistically 50-50, maybe even less. Um, and that's quite worrying. Like, I think we are very lucky that democracy is as widespread as it is, rather than authoritarian regimes, which are absolutely the norm throughout um, post-hunter-gatherer uh, post um, society. Um, and I worry that in the future that that won't happen too. So it's plausible to me that democracy is possible at all because of the current technological setup we have, where Basically, guns are a democratizing force. And this is a, a weird thing to say. I'm not like a gun's rights advocate or anything. Um, but it means that, um, well, I think there's a couple of, sorry, I've gone on too long. But a couple of things. Um, so one is just like, it's somewhat hard for um, leaders to take, um, to become kind of tyrants, um, become dictators, because there's always the military as a potential um, source of a coup, potential threat. Now imagine your army is automated because you have um, a, a, an army of autonomous weapons and said AIs. Can in principle be controlled by one, one person? That mechanism disappears. Secondly, a, a reason for democracy is that um, people, people are like the engines of new ideas. That's the engines of kind of economic progress. But again, now suppose the workforce, um, especially the kind of um, research workforce, is automated too. Because again, we've got these AI um, researchers. Again, like really takes away one of the arguments of democracy. 
And so I do worry that in a post-AI world, um, you might, there might be very strong reasons um, that push us back in a kind of authoritarian direction. Because you really could have like a few people controlling the entire economy and time ability and so on. And yeah, I would see that protecting democracy and ensuring that this kind of more egalitarian world continues after the advent of very advanced AI systems um, is a kind of key thing for us to do. We'll go to the Jacob over there. Yeah. Yeah, hi. So you mentioned that it took you some time to arrive at the position that the future onboard lives are <clears throat> maybe not equally, but they're worth mm -hmm. thinking about. And it took you years to arrive at this conclusion. How can you help speed up this, the development of this insight for others so we can, maybe us in this room have now appreciated the point, but how can you get the rest of the 7 billion uh, to get this to this position faster? Uh, sure, well, look, like, read this book. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that is actually kind of partly why I wrote this. Um, I do think, uh, I think there were certain misconceptions that I had at the time, even just on the ethics side of things. Like, to begin with, I really thought that the only game in town, if you really want to influence the really long term, is to prevent kind of the whole human race going extinct, because nothing else would have a long-term impact. I think that isn't true. I think lots and lots of things have a long-term impact. And this book is fine to kind of um, expanded on that. Uh, but then the second thing, the real thing that was a stickler for me was just more practical than um, uh, philosophical, which is just like, okay, cool, there's this enormous amount of stake in the future, but what can we even do? Like, what sort of changes can we make? Especially like 10 years, you know, you know, it was 10 years ago and people were really worrying about pandemics <laughs> and AI on the spaces, and it was like, this seems so speculative and futuristic, no one's ever, you know, is this even a real thing? And now 10 years later, it's like, okay, yeah, those are real things um, we've really learned over time. And we have a much better sense now of um, things that we can actually do. Um, so there's a whole suite of things with respect to reducing pandemic risk, um, from uh, surveillance and uh, monitoring to faster vaccine development to um, things like a certain form of lighting that kind of just sterilizes the air, um, means you could actually just entirely eradicate respiratory diseases. Um, then with respect to AI, there's tons of things in both the government space developing um, like good regulatory systems, but then also uh, technical safety work to ensure that AI systems are aligned. And actually, honestly, so much of this has happened over the last couple of years that um, you know, if I could immediately revise this book, I would actually build more of these kind of concrete solutions that we have available to us um, into that book. Um, and I think that's the thing that's really going to convince people, because people People who aren't philosophers <laughs> tend to be much more concerned by like, okay, what can we practically do with our from like, what is this overall world? We're going to go to you with the glasses right there. Okay. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for today and all the work that you've been doing, especially around um, techniques and thoughts and ideas about how to move philanthropy, especially with uh, Give What You Can. And I would say philanthropy is a topic that we don't talk too much about in Sweden. So I want to just take advantage of you being here, maybe to give a bit of inspiration. For me personally, I think that philanthropy is the most highly risk-tolerant asset class available. It should be the most innovative, badass funding that we move. Um, but I would guess there aren't that many people in the room that consider themselves philanthropists. So I wonder if you could say something about that and maybe shift, shift some minds. Yeah. About should be or could be moving that kind of funding um, in addition to the Swedish government, just individuals? Uh, great. Well, yeah, so I'm aware that yeah, Sweden doesn't have nearly as much of the culture of philanthropy as um, uh, some of the countries, like, like the US. Um, and partly that's for good reason. Sweden just has a much more um, you know, functional and effective government than um, other countries. Um, however, government, ac government action is itself limited. So. You can think about like failures of decision decision making in terms of market failure. So you know markets aren't going to take care of everything. You need the government to step in. But then there's also democratic failure as well, where the Swedish government its responsibility is to look after the people of Sweden, not people on the other side of the world. Certainly not people in a hundred years' time. And um, you know Swedish Sweden has a very um, cosmopolitan culture, which is like fantastic. Uh, but that will still be limited. And that does mean that there's a scope for like effective, careful philanthropy, where philanthropy can, um, as you say, focus on things that 
governments are otherwise not going to touch because they're concerning issues that are not kind of burning and fessing right now. So AI is suddenly, you know, we had a decade of governments being like, oh, this AI stuff is like a fascinating lunch conversation. Obviously, you could never take any action about it. But now, suddenly, they're wanting to put in regulations. It is a very good thing that we had um, a decade's worth of philanthropy before this point doing the relevant research so that we actually have some relevant things to say about how regulatory regimes could be put in place. So it can have a longer term um, timeline. Um, it can also just um, be willing to take bets where if the government invests a whole bunch of money into something and it uh, doesn't pay off, it's kind of embarrassing for them. But philanthropists instead can take risks. Um, in particular, research funding. And we've seen enormous success with that. So um, uh, I think it was the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations that funded Norman Borlaug to develop short stem disease resistant wheat, which, um, you know, again, it's kind of speculative research invention. But when Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Prize, it was kind of saving a billion lives. Um, it was, uh, you know, staved off hundreds of millions of people from dying um, from hunger. So. Even though philanthropy is not a big part of Swedish culture, I just think it's this hugely impactful way of doing good. Because it means that you can support whoever is the very best in the world at um, working on the problem that um, you're trying to solve. Because money is just almost always pretty useful in furtherance of an organization's games. I think we have time for two more questions. So we're going to go to you back there, so with the, with the beard. <laughs> So, hi, thank you. Um, the, the current economic system is heavily, heavily discounting the future. Uh, do, do you see any trends, any new discussions around this stuff? Yeah, well, um, so yeah, the current economic system heavily discounts the future. Um, and in fact, governments have, they set discount rates. So when they assess the value of a project, they um, uh, look at the finance, the economic benefits and um, basically subtract a bit off, a percentage of the, value, of the economic value off, the further into the future that goes. And in some circumstances, there are very good reasons for doing that, because if you have money earlier, you can invest it and the money will grow. Also, if you expect to be richer in the future, um, additional um, resources are worth more. Um, but lots of bad reasons, like the uh, uh, discounting happens, or reasons where discounting isn't appropriate. So for example, if someone dies now, if someone dies in 10 years, that's equally bad. Um, there's not a reason for discounting that person's death, but economists in fact do that. Um, thankfully, the, the needle is moving at least a little bit. So uh, the US actually recently changed its discount rate from, uh, I think it was 3.2% to 1.7%. Um, I don't think that's particularly because of the arguments of philosophers, unfortunately, but rather because the long-term interest rate has gone down, um, and that's what they're still using. But there is at least a little bit of a push in that direction, and it helps. And that means that um, uh, governments will take kind of longer, um, uh, yeah, like have longer time horizons. In the UK as well, they actually use a declining discount rate. So the further into the future they look, the less um, uh, they look, the less they discount. And that is on the basis of, um, uh, yeah, the economists who actually understand the theory a little bit more and philosophers kind of pushing for this. So, you know, there's some progress and mild progress in a positive direction. That's yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah, expanding on the, on the, uh, the comment here or ask the question about philanthropy. So, Norwegian House is obviously, uh, uh, it's founded by someone who had a lot of money and uh, deployed that uh, into, into a foundation. I think there are even some people in this room that has more money than they, they will ever spend. Mm -hmm. And that money is either tied up in shares uh, or in money, or, it, or shares that can be converted into money. Do you have any ideas for, for, for those people or for those of us that might be building something? How, could we, how do we convert into future value if, if we don't want to buy yachts? Yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount to do. Um, so in terms of places to go, so I think like, you know, one should think about donations with the same seriousness that you would think about investing your money or making large purchases and so on. Like, it's big, in fact, it's a much bigger responsibility. Um, and so there are kind of two sources um, for advice that I recommend. So um, for larger philanthropists, people who might be thinking of setting up their own foundation, 
Um, long view philanthropy is a philanthropic organization, and again, it's kind of informed by similar ideas to those that I promote in the book. It provides absolutely outstanding kind of boutique advice, so that's long view philanthropy. And then secondly, for individual donors, you can go on uh, Giving What We Can, which is an organization I co-founded, uh, encourages people to give more, but also has recommendations of um, a variety of funds. So there's a long-termism fund, again, if you're convinced by the arguments here. Um, but even but if you're not convinced, fine, <laughs> the arguments are complex. There's also funds for uh, global health and development, climate change, animal welfare, and so on. Um, and then you can, yes, either just defer to experts who are working on this, um, or use that as an opportunity to dig in and yeah, do your own research. What about Founders Pledge? And yeah, there's Founders Pledge as well. So um, another kind of organization broadly assigned, aligned with effective optimism where um, uh, yeah, for people starting companies, maybe in this building, um, you can pledge to give, uh, I think, at least 2% of your profits upon exit. And they can find boutique advice as well. We have one more. Yes, go. Um, discussing before here, uh, I'm from uh, the more the NGO world, and uh, we we'll create like equality and in, in different uh, suburban areas and so on. And one thing that we are talking about now, especially in Sweden, and what you said, like the institutional money is going to go down. We will already see it <coughs> due to political issues or just the way it is. So what we do and what we wonder, like in the NGO and civil sector, is Fine, we know there is a lot of money, like you say, uh, but I wonder what is the main uh, problematic, like structural wise issues to get that money out into these organizations where, I mean, I could give you three, five thousand organizations that would need anything from 10,000 to maybe just a million. And uh, that would be so, so, so valuable. We're not talking about 20 million every time or whatever, but this, the possibility for those organizations to find new people or whatever, it's very, very limited. You don't have people or staff or whatever or knowledge and so on. And we were talking about innovation and so on. So it's just like in the room, but also from what you know, mm -hmm. the main, what, what, do we knew, what do we need to get that <coughs> money all the way out mm -hmm. and not just like, on companies, or so it's like all the way out to the NGOs and actually to people. Yeah, um, yeah. So I certainly can't speak to the kind of um, like governmental funding or anything like that. It's not something I know about in Sweden. Um, from a philanthropic perspective, I think we really can um, try and just create a new culture, especially among the very rich, where you know by default you give most of your wealth away. But not only that. So the giving pledge, you know does that, but most of the giving pledge Chinese, like, they leave till they're the will, leave it in the will if they do actually fulfill the pledge. Instead, having a culture that's like, no, you start giving now, um, because the problems that we face, they're really urgent, and you can have a bigger impact now than you can if you wait for 50 years or maybe never give at all. And, um, uh, yeah, I guess Northman is um, demonstrating that in, uh, um, in practice, and that's wonderful to see. Perfect place to wrap up with. <laughs> so, William, I want to thank you again.